Tonight, I am very excited to be joined by Conservative commentator, author and speaker and host of The Michael Knowles Show on The Daily Wire, Michael Knowles. Michael's best-selling book, Reasons to Vote Democrat, was released to rapturous reviews despite being composed of 266 blank pages. Makes sense to me. His latest book, Speechless, Controlling Mar Words Controlling Minds, is out now. The Daily Wire was started in 2015 by two friends, Jeremy Burring and Ben Shapiro, and is the fastest-growing conservative website in America. Beloved of millions of sensible-minded Americans, as well as being home to Michael's show, also causing trouble online are the mega-brain of Ben Shapiro, Andrew Claven, and Matt Walsh, creator of the hugely popular What is a Woman documentary. And when he is not attracting non-binary rage from his frequent campus speaking engagements, which I highly recommend you look up. Earlier this year, Michael caused controversy at CPAC when he shared his thoughts on transgender ideology. There can be no middle way in dealing with transgenderism. It is all or nothing. If transgenderism is true, if men really can become women, then it's true for everybody of all ages. If transgenderism is false, as it is, if men really can't become women, as they cannot, then it's false for everybody, too. And if it's false, then we should not indulge it, especially since that indulgence requires taking away the rights and customs of so many people. If it is false, then for the good of society, and especially for the good of the poor people who have fallen prey to this confusion, Transgenderism must be eradicated from public life entirely. The whole preposterous ideology. Good evening, Michael. Lawrence, wonderful to be with you. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. Um, Michael, why has mankind abandoned truth and started to worship lies? Well, the long answer, the way historical answer, is that uh, our ancestor ate an apple in the Garden of Eden, and sin and death pervade the world, and the father of lies is the uh, leader of the principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. That's the old religious answer, and you see this play out time and time again. But I totally grant you, Lawrence, sometimes it gets a little better, sometimes it gets a little worse, and we are living in a period where it has become extraordinarily egregious that today, if you acknowledge the difference between a man and a woman, if you state a basic fact that a man cannot become a woman, you can be ostracized from society, you can be fired from your job, you can be prosecuted in some places. So the, the left has become extraordinarily aggressive about this. And the question why, I, I think I would defer to one of your countrymen. I know it's become cliche to cite George Orwell in 1984, but this is the plot of 1984, which is that if a power can get you to lie, that is an extraordinary exercise of that power. They will have a lot of control over you. And worse still, if they can get you to believe the lie, if that power can get you not, not to be able to discern between truth and falsehood, well, then they've just totally gotten you. And so people still have common sense. I think today people still can tell the difference between truth and lies generally. But, but it, there is a culture of confusion that is spreading here. And it's why, it's why the left is so insistent on pushing this issue. Sometimes the left will say, what do you care? Who cares if you use the wrong pronoun? Who cares if a man goes into the woman's bathroom? And the answer to that, of course, is, well, you all seem to care. <laughs> you, you all on the left are spending a lot of time and money and energy trying to get me to call a man she and trying to let a woman, or a man rather, into the woman's bathroom. And, and you want to do that because words shape the way that we view the world. Uh, it, it shapes our entire worldview. And they believe that if they can control the language, they can control our minds. And we're seeing now, uh, uh, you know, a sort of corporate war with, with, with wokeism and, and, you know, Anheuser-Busch and Transheuser-Busch, as you call them, and, and others. What's in it for these companies to divide down um, ideological lines when all you really want from a beer company or, or, a, or a running apparatus company is just their product? You don't want a political lecture from a, from a corporation. What, who's behind this? I I certainly don't want a political lecture from my beer company, and Transheiser Bush is suffering greatly for this. They've lost something like $12 billion in market cap, and, and the prices, the, the revenues rather, keep getting worse for them. This is affecting other companies, companies uh, like Target and Ford and others. Why are they doing it? 
They're doing it because the people who control the investment and the people who control the, the uh, industry multinational organizations that, that set standards for the industry, they are on the side of radicalism, especially as we head into the liberal liturgical month of pride, which, as you rightly point out, is now taking up about a quarter of the year. Uh, those people are, are pushing this radical ideology. The customers generally are not, but in the short run, it makes more sense for these companies to go along with the asset managers, the big institutional investors. There are basically three big asset managers that are going to control a large number of corporations around the world. That would be BlackRock, Vanguard, and State Street. Well, they've all signed on to the ESG, Environmental Social Governance, woke policies. And if a company violates those policies, that's going to severely hamper their, their ESG score, and they're going to find themselves on the wrong side of the people with the money. Same goes for GARM. GARM is a, a project not only of a lot of multinational corporations, it's now been adopted by the World Economic Forum and all of the uh, left-wingers who find themselves in the highest echelons of the liberal establishment. Garm says that if you uh, contradict the woke agenda, if you contradict transgenderism in this case in particular, you will be punished. You won't have access to advertising. You won't have access to certain platforms. And so we, we recognize there's a big difference between the people and what the people believe and the political order and those who pull the levers of power. And this is one of those issues where it is so clear. Uh, but, but in the long run, of course, the, this enmeshment between the non-government organizations, the governments, and the corporations uh, does provide the liberals a lot of, of control and the ability to advance their agenda. It's just the pesky people who, who occasionally push back and say, no, thank you. And we, and we bemoan, uh, a conservative would always bemoan cancel culture. They would, they would say that cancel culture is the most insidious uh, attack on individual thoughts and rights to think. But at the same time, what we're doing now is, is we're encouraging boycotts. And, and we're essentially, we're, we're having to play the game that's being played against us by returning a, a cancel culture to them. Do you think that's the effective way you were saying... Uh, you said earlier, you know, we have to obliterate transgenderism as an ideology, not transgender people, because, as you quite rightly point out, they don't really exist. It's no such thing. But it, is, our, is boycotting in our own version of cancel culture the way to deal with these, with these ideologues? Well, all cultures cancel, and all cultures have standards and norms and taboos. We're not going to get around that. Now, you and I, Lawrence, and I think common sense, ordinary conservative people would like to have a nice, open-minded, civil kind of country where we can all get along. And the left would like to push us all out of the public square. But there does have to be a line. The reason that my CPAC speech caused such an uproar is because everybody, most especially the liberals, uh, knew the point to be true. And the point is this. On certain issues, we can meet in the middle and find a conciliatory middle ground. On taxes, say, I want lower taxes, someone wants higher taxes, okay, we meet in the middle. Immigration, I want much less migration, some people want more, okay, we meet somewhere in the middle. On the issue of transgenderism, either women are going to have bathrooms or they won't. Either women are going to be able to have their own cycling leagues or they won't. The minute that one man gets to enter the woman's bathroom or one man gets to compete against women in sports, then women lose that. And so we, we simply have to pick a side. We cannot simultaneously establish mutually contradictory principles in society. So now we have an option. Are we going to live according to how we have lived for thousands of years and according to a way that happens to be true, which is that men and women are different? Or are we going to live according to the way we've lived for the past, I don't know, five minutes, which says that men and women are exactly the same and men can become women and vice versa? We're going to have to pick one. And I would just as soon live under the, the standard that happens to be true and has served us well for a very long time than the radical new leftist standard. So we, you, you made an allusion earlier, a, a, a biblical allusion, which was, um, you know, this stuff comes, goes right back to the, to the Garden of Eden. W would you say that next up on the list for our friends on the extreme left is religion itself? Of course, it, it always is. The church has, has always been the object here. Th this is why, by the way, the left is so insistent upon redefining marriage. The, the Christian understanding of marriage is that marriage is a symbol of the relationship between Christ and his church. And then at the level of just nature, we recognize 
that marriage is the fundamental building block. We're not just atomized individuals. We didn't just pop out of the sky, free floating. We're born into a family from a mommy and a daddy. That the family is the basic political unit. And so if the left wants to upend society, it's not enough just to take over the schools. It's not enough not just to take over the media. They have to attack that fundamental political unit in order to redefine it. And one great way to do that for them, one very effective way, will be to redefine man and woman. But of course, it is a rebellion against the, the church. Uh, Whitaker Chambers, the former communist who became more conservative in the 20th century, Chambers said that communism, we can, we can broaden it to radical leftism, is not a new ideology. It's actually one of the oldest ideologies. It began in the Garden of Eden when the serpent told Eve, ye shall be as gods. Uh, John F. Kennedy liked to say, some people see things that are and say why. I dream things that never were and say why not. That's a line that he, he cribbed from George Bernard Shaw. And Shaw put the line in the mouth of the serpent in the garden, tempting Eve. That's the difference here. Will we make ourselves gods and craft a world after our own fantasies? Or we, will we recognize that there is such a thing as reality, moral, biological, and everywhere in between? And will we live our lives in accordance with that reality, which is, of course, the only way that one actually can flourish? And do you, do you think that the, the tables are turning, that, that, that people are, are, are now wiser to this, that, you, that your average ordinary person, we've seen it with the, with the, the boycotts, but we, are you sensing in America the, the, where you have a First Amendment that people really want to speak out? And, and, and what, how do you think that might feed into the, to the presidential primaries and the, and the presidential election itself? Yes, the, the people get it. I have never been more encouraged than I am by the people, by mothers showing up at their school board saying they don't want their kids being taught radical gender ideology in school. You're seeing this reflected in the presidential campaigns of Donald Trump, of Ron DeSantis, and of Vivek Ramaswamy, and of, of other people too. So this is very much catching on here in the United States. And so you're seeing a reaction from the left to clamp down on all of this. And the reason I mentioned earlier GARM, ESG, the World Economic Forum, the big asset managers, is because while the government of the United States has to abide by the First Amendment, while the public institutions have to abide by it, the corporations do not. And so what happens is that the government outsources the censorship, outsources its dirty work to these corporations, to the social media platforms. When you look at three social media platforms controlling speech in the public square, Google, Facebook, and Twitter, which fortunately now is owned by Elon Musk, it, th those guys control 90% of the flow of information around the internet. And in a republic, the flow of information, speech, is how you govern yourself. So that is now where the focus has to lie. Will we be able to insist upon ordinary, broad standards of speech in that corporate, semi-private sphere? Because if not, we can, we can uh, celebrate the First Amendment till kingdom come. We still will lose our ability to state basic truths if we don't act quickly. Well, we have the online harms bill coming through uh, Parliament at the moment, which is terrifying, and every opportunity is used to do it. Um, Michael, quick prediction. How do you see the uh, presidential election coming, going? I'm not so foolish as to put all my money on the table with any candidate. We're still very early on. Uh, the polls show it is Donald Trump's race to lose. Uh, but uh, we, we've got a new candidate in the race, DeSantis. I mentioned my friend Vivek Ramaswamy. There are a number of other people there. And I'll just tell you this. Compared to past elections, if our choices are between Donald Trump, greatest president of my lifetime, Ron DeSantis, greatest governor in America today, an outside candidate like Vivek, a number of other candidates in the field, the conservatives are in good shape. Then we'll just have to figure out how to win the general. And what will happen with, sorry, just finally, what, uh, Biden I've been watching for the last couple of days and he seems to really have slightly fallen off a cliff in a way, uh, you know, emotionally and intellectually. Um, what, what, what about Robert Kennedy? Will, will Robert Kennedy get a look in here on the Democrat side? Robert Kennedy is a wonderful figure in this race because he's an old liberal Democrat from the 1960s. And you can't just write him off because he's Bobby Kennedy's son. <laughs> he's President Kennedy's nephew. This is a major figure in the Democrat Party. And his very existence is a major thorn in the side of Joe Biden and the Democrats because he shows, almost like someone frozen in amber from the heyday of the Democratic Party, 
He shows just how far the Democrats have fallen, just how radical they have become. Uh, you mentioned Biden's fallen off a cliff. Not literally yet, though. It could be any day now. And he's certainly fallen off in terms of his polls. The question is, will it matter? Will that be reflected in, in the vote come November? Well, we're going to have to find out. Michael Knowles, thank you so much for joining me.